see. So first of all, it's my pleasure to present here. And I'm going to present something about surface wave. And in particular, I'm going to talk a little bit on surface wave observations through a seismic array. And I'm going to use um, the US array as a demonstration, not just because it's a, such a nice array, uh, but more important is the array I work on. So I will pretty much focus on this area. And I, I just want to uh, echo um, what Ellen just mentioned this morning. So somehow I realized I, I kind of get lucky to start a project here. This is really a very nice thesis project for me because um, first you got new data. So it is, have a very well posed problem, which Ellen mentioned. So this is what uh, we want to use surface wave to study um, the structure beneath uh, Western US, for example. And, and more important, um, my advice, I have a funding for this. So somehow I can just focus on this without doing TA and RA. And another nice thing about this is everything uh, can be published. And I think that's the most important part. So um, let me just start it. Um, in this talk, I'm going to introduce surface wave. Just a very basic introduction on um, what surface wave is and what can generate surface wave. And then I will also talk a little bit what can affect surface wave. So you know, in a sense, uh, I will say, if something can affect surface wave, then by observing surface wave, that means you can infer for that. And that usually means the velocity structure of the Earth. And another thing is um, I'm going to show you some of the fundamental surface wave observation from both earthquake and ambient noise. So this ambient noise technique is more developed more recently, like around uh, within the five, past five years, and it's very advanced. So this technique actually allows us to image uh, very shallow structures, such as cross and upper mouse mantle, with a very high resolution. So it's a very big development. And I will introduce a little bit on that. Then I will go into um, the, the center of the talk, which is how we use this kind of surface wave observation to infer for 2D sur surface wave uh, tomography. And I will introduce ambient noise application and earthquake application. In the end, I will try to show some of the result for inverting 3D uh, structures. So the, the way I make uh, this present presentation is because this is pretty much um, the outline of what I learned in, over the last six years. So I will pretty much follow uh, how I learned this and hopefully um, just follow the same path I can introduce surface wave to you. And hopefully my last six uh, years, not that boring for you so everybody can enjoy the talk. So first year, I will, <laughs> well, well, actually the first half year I started TAing so I didn't learn much. But the second part, I start to uh, learn a little bit on what surface wave really is. So if you look just a 1D Earth structure, so for example, here is a print model. And um, in the um, shallow part, you actually see that the velocity structure actually increased almost monotonically. So here, at the shallow part, is very slow, and it's going faster and faster. So for me, I always feel, I always think surface wave as some sort of wave trapping near the surface. So instead of like body wave, if you have earthquake, body wave actually penetrates through the interior of the Earth. Actually, I always feel that surface wave is something trapped near the surface because of this low velocity zone. And this is actually uh, somehow similar to the waveguide properties. So for example, uh, to generate optic fiber such as the one shown here, what happens is you need a low velocity zone in the center of the optic fiber so the light will not leak out. So in many way that um, this low velocity zone act as a waveguide and trap the surface wave. And there's some important property, um, some consequence of this kind of structure. So in general, although a surface wave propagate near the surface, it have some depth sensitivity. So the longer the period of surface wave, the longer the wavelength is, and the deeper it's sensitive to. So wave with different frequency actually propagate in a slightly different way, which I will talk a little, talk a little, little bit later. So um, in general, it's two types of surface wave. One called up wave. So a wave is propagating in that direction, and the particle is moving 
in the uh, horizontal component. So this is the, um, the wave with particle moving horizontal and uh, perpendicular to the direction of wave propagation. So um, this wave is particular sense to SH wave. SH means that the wave is propagated in this direction and polarized in the horizontal component. And different from lap wave, um, you also have a, another type of surface wave called Rayleigh wave, which um, the particle motion is both in the vertical direction as well as in the radial direction. And here is a very nice animation from um, Google. And um, what you can see that is first, the different from lap wave, which is only sensitive to shear velocity structure. Actually, if you look at the shallow part of Rayleigh wave, you can see there's a compressible wave propagate near the surface. So Rayleigh wave, although it's still most sensitive to shear wave, it does sensitive to a little bit uh, P wave structure near the shallow part of the Earth. And, and if you look closer, the shear wave is sensitive to its mostly up-down motion of the particle motion. So it's uh, different from SH wave, it's sensitive to SB wave where the wave propagates in horizontal direction, but polarizing vertical component. And as I said, um, you have very important properties of surface wave is the depth uh, sensitivity. For different period surface wave, for example, Rayleigh wave shown here, a short period, 35 seconds, the wavelength is around like 120 kilometer horizontally. <laughs> but um, it has this width of sensitivity to the interior of the Earth. So the peak is around like 70 kilometer for 35 second ready wave. But when you, your wavelengths become longer, or the period become longer, wavelengths become longer, then it starts to sensitive to deeper Earth as well. Like if you go to 350, then um, you start to sensitive to more deeper structure. And last wave, while um, for, from short to long period wave, all most sensitive to shallow structure, but the sensitivity tends to get broader and broader when you go to longer period. So, um, in fact, by using this kind of dispersion property, by studying surface wave at different period, it uh, allow you to study the Earth at different depth. So, what kind of um, thing can generate surface wave? So of course you have traditional earthquake where here shows a subduction and when there's um, stress lock here, when you have stress release through an earthquake, then ground is shaking and then the wave propagate out. But you can also have explosion shown here, um, which also generate surface wave. But there's other type, like if you have meteorite hitting the earth, that will generate surface wave as well. So there's a whole lot of different things can generate earthquake, uh, sorry, generate surface wave. So this is what we typically call single source surface wave. So it does have a well, very well defined um, signal. So if you have the earthquake, body wave propagates through the interior of Earth, which arrive much faster, so as blue we go here, and the surface wave propagates slower and travel around the um, shallow part of the Earth, it shows as the main arrival shown here. And um, usually the surface wave is the largest signal in after earthquake. So if you live in a seismic active zone, like I live in Taiwan, and usually when I lie on the bed and sleeping, then I wake up by two, like one shake, and usually that's the P wave, and I will wait for a, a, a small amount of time to feel this S wave, then I will decide whether I should run. They usually <laughs> try because in Taiwan the building is so like they know the earthquake will happen, so usually people just stay at home. Uh, unless you live in a countryside and you start running. But but this is the most uh, wave that cause problem and um, but the nice thing is this wave propagate near the shallow part of the earth, so it's very sensitive to shallow structure and hence we can use it to infer for shallow structure. So sometimes, um, if you really have a large earthquake, like the Symmetra earthquake, which is 9.0, then you actually see not just the wave coming at you, actually go around the globe a couple of times. For example, here shows the seismogram uh, from very close station to very far away station. And this, 
uh, signal actually propagate, move out very nicely over here. And that's the R1 path. But the wave can only go around another part, path. And that will show up on this part over here. And then the wave keep going around the globe. So you can keep seeing it coming and going a couple of times. So this only, uh, you can observe for, this, uh, for very large earthquakes. And um, that just show you how the energy can be trapped just near the surface without dissipate that fast. So what else can generate surface wave? Um, the, here's two, like, not traditional, considered as a good source. It, uh, first is, like, if you have automatic perturbation, such as tornado or just regular wind, all those can affect, shake the ground a little bit, and all those produce surface wave. And another type of um, perturbation, which is probably more important, is the oceanic wave perturbation. So on the ocean, you have typically have wave going through it, and it keeps shaking the seafloor, and that somehow coupled into the ground and start producing some surface wave. So since we live on a dynamic Earth, you have a lot of things perturbing the ground. And this is usually what you observe. When you, you don't have an earthquake, if you just cut a uh, seismogram out, this is typical seismogram. So you don't see any good signal. But all this small wiggle actually is some sort of, I, I, later on I will try to argue this is all surface wave propagating um, near the surface of the Earth. So if we just do a power spectrum or just do a Fourier uh, transformation, then try to uh, look what kind of wave, what kind of frequency is dominating our noise, then what you often find is that this will be the uh, spectrum you will observe. So um, here is from 3 seconds to 30 seconds, you will see there's two dominate peak over here, which is correspond to oceanic wave. And um, because most earthquakes can be only observed above 30 seconds, so um, this, the, the ability to extract surface wave from ambient noise will fill the gap for this part of the spectrum. And as I mentioned, different period of surface wave actually sensitive to deeper, uh, different depth of the structure. For traditional earthquake, if you can only observe surface wave above 30 seconds, that means your sensitivity usually is beneath like 40 kilometer. So that means you cannot resolve shallow structure very well, like crustal structure. But now if you can extract some sort of information from ambient noise, then that means that um, you can start to look structure in, in the crust, which might be interesting um, in terms of uh, understanding some geology feature. So just uh, note here and here is the, what they call primary and secondary micro seismism. So if um, just show some map around California, actually somewhere near here. Um, for, for on the top, you can see there's a big Central Valley Basin over here, and there's Sierra Nevada. And what actually affects, so if surface wave propagate through this region, we actually expect uh, wave will have different trouble with different velocity across basin and um, the Sierra Nevada because the rock type is very different between these two regions. In the Sierra Nevada, it's most igneous rock, so it's very hot and solid, so you expect wave propagate much faster. And in the Central Valley, since it's sedimentary rock, you kind of expect all the wave propagate slower. And by studying surface wave, hopefully we will be able to um, distinguish this kind of geologic feature. And another thing, um, we try to, we might be able to see is um, in the deeper part, we can see some feature in the mantle. Although the mantle does not have significant, probably does not have significant composition difference, such as in the crust, but you do have some kind of temperature perturbation. Like near, if you have near the subduction slab, it's cold and likely the wave will propagate a little bit faster. Then if you have a thermal plume near the Yellowstone, then the, everything is uh, hotter and maybe propagate a little bit slower. So we, I would say this is the first, uh, first order effect. So it's the velocity structure will most affect how surface wave propagates. But there's also secondary um, 
effect, which is anisotropy. So as you know, we uh, live on a dynamic Earth, so everything is moving. So in the interior of the Earth, there's a lot of stress. And a couple of talks, um, I, don't know if I forgot whether it was yesterday or the day before, I mentioned that when you have stress, then um, it deforms the rock, and some mineral tend to align by itself. Then because the mineral, such as olivine, um, is an isotropic, that means that after you align them, then you should see some signal of an isotropy. And I will also I will say this is probably the second order effect, which is much smaller, but um, it is observable. But and just Fong Lin uh, introduced an isotropy yesterday. Uh, he me mentioned that he feels surface wave and isotropy is much complicated than body wave. But I, I think I will argue the opposite. I think this is probably easier. Um, particular after his talk, I, I guess. I was a little bit lost <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> so, OK, so second year of my uh, PhD. And um, it's very exciting. I start to look some real seismogram. And this is the array I use. It's such a beautiful array. Um, so it, cover, it will cover the whole US. And right now, the red part is already either already been deployed or it's um, is still in, on site. It's, the, it's still current running. And the purple part is what will eventually get filled um, in the next one year or two. So this, um, each station is approximately have like 70 kilometer resolution. And that's pretty much also the resolution um, surface wave tomography can achieve. So um, as I will show later on, the structure we cons construct, the model we construct is pretty much have the resolution of 70 kilometer. So this is very nice array, and we I will show some um, surface wave observed through this array. So here shows one example of earthquake. So this one actually happened near Kyrio Island, which is uh, northern north of Japan. And um, if you look all the seismogram observed within the U.S. array, and if I plot it sorted by the distance. You can see very clear body wave, propagate P wave, S wave, SS wave. Then you will see a big signal, really wave. So it's very hard to miss because it always arrives uh, later than body wave, and it always have the largest amplitude. And another way to look how the wave propagates through this is look uh, like animation style uh, movie. So let me just stop this a little bit. So what I uh, shown here is the um, U.S. array exists while um, during that particular earthquake, and the the color here shows the particle motion in vertical direction. So if it's red, it's mo moving up. If it's blue, it's moving down. And this seismogram corresponding to the uh, station over here. And if I just let it run, you can see the wave going through it coherently, like S wave. SS wave, then wait a little bit, then it comes surface wave moving across it. So the idea is we will use the surface wave, observe how surface wave propagates through this region, and try to invert structure beneath here. So that will be our goal, and um, I will show several examples how we can achieve that later on. So that's earthquake. and. As I mentioned, because we want to study shallow structure as well, so that means we need to use ambient noise. So again, this is just an example of the ambient noise we observe. So um, recently, there's theoretic and numerical studies show how ambient noise potentially can be used to extract um, surface wave. So if you have a numerical simulation set up like this, all the red dot in the, here is considered as a single source or random source for the noise. And if you put two stations here, then this is pretty much what you will observe. Very noisy data, and you don't see any good signal which you can use in terms of tomography. But if the, source is, the noise source is almost homogeneous in this area, then after you do cross correlation between these two um, seismograms, then what you find is that you will start to see very clear signal. So just don't think about too much like how this really works. Um, just think 
for, for this, to get this, what essentially you have is that if you have a homogeneous source, then consider one station as an impulse force. Like um, if, if you consider as an impulse force moving upside down or, or in, in this vertical direction, then what you observe at this here actually is the, the impulse response of that due to that force and observe at that station. So that's this part. And also, um, because you have two stations, and each station can be considered a source. So you can also put, consider this part as an impulse force over here. And this will be the signal observed over here. So um, I guess I should stop here a little bit and make sure everybody understands how this concept works. Because um, later on, a lot of examples will show based on ambient noise. So if there's any question, maybe now is a good time? Yes. OK. Any? <laughs> Is this clear or I don't know? Is everybody know what cross correlation is? Who does not know what cross correlation is? One person? Oh, come on, there's got to be somebody. <laughs> <laughs> is there any cross correlation on the board? Well, okay. Yeah. Well, cross correlation is defined here, but. Uh, let's see. Is green good? Or? Green is bad. Uh, let's see. So, if you have two seismograms, th this is first station, this is second station. What cross question do does? What happens is really do an integral, um, and you keep shift shifting one of the seismograms. For example, it, of the U two pier, um, for for a tau amount of tau, and do an integration, and you just multiply that and do an integration. So you keep shifting it. So the cross correction of these two will probably give you a spike, and if there's zero time, the difference between here and that will be the difference between this and that. Um, so this will be tau, and this will be tau. Is that useful? <laughs> This is the kind of thing that people couldn't do by hand, right? And yet, if the, the amount of information is too low. Yeah, usually it's just all computation. Yeah, data in yeah. order to make, it, to make the noise have coherence. Right, yeah. Usually we take like one or two years of data. Well, it depends on the station distance. But usually we do like two years. But that's be pretty much because US array only exists for two years, like for each station. No, this is just uh, uh, this is actually simulation. So this is defined the uh, uh, region of our simulation. Yeah, yeah. And that so when you know everyone's used to the idea of statistical correlation, things are correlated. This is the same function. So when if you say something's correlated statistically, that means that you're passing it over. And then if you normalize it, and if you normalize it according to the power in u1 and u2, then the maximum that can so a correlation of one, of course, is high correlated, and zero is low correlated. So this is just the same function, but it's right. applied to uh, geophysical time series. Right, yeah. All right. So yeah, just as I said, like, um, you, you can kind of forget about the cross grain. Just remember, if you have a homogeneous source, what happens is that by using this method, you actually create a point source on the map if, where you have station. I'm not sure which one go first, actually. Uh, we talked about it a long time ago. Yeah. They talked about this a long time ago? OK. It was his PhD thesis. OK. <laughs> and, and I guess the reason <laughs> I, I guess the reason why people really not try very early on is because if you look at the Earth, if the other source is happening within the ocean, then you really don't have a homogeneous source. And so people have been questioning about uh, whether this can really be done, and but I guess that cannot stop seismologists for trying. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, well, in, and as I will later on show, it works. So that, that's good. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, I will not be here, and <laughs> I was stuck in my thesis. So, um, just show a real example, like how how the signal comes out. Like if you have two TA station, one here and one here, if you just do cross correlation between 
vertical and vertical component. That's ZZ over here. And this is a typical cross correlation you will observe. So you see a very clear signal over here and here. And the window here actually is predicted by uh, the velocity of a uh, typical surface wave. So actually, for right into the region you predict, there will be a have, have surface wave. And so vertical, vertical cross correlation is essentially if you put a vertical force over here, and this should generate Rayleigh wave. So it, the wave will rotate, uh, will keep coming, and it will arrive at the second station shown here. And again, it's, there's some symmetric. If you apply a point force over here, you see the signal over there. So these two are actually uh, provide similar information. And most time, we just add them up and take the average. And we can also do radio and radio cross correlation. So if you generate a point force in radio component, this also generates Rayleigh wave and should uh, you can observe Rayleigh wave in radio component. So very nicely, and they arrive at the same time as the lead lead cross correlation. And if you want to get love wave, since love wave only have uh, you only have particle motion in the transverse component, so you need to impose a point force in the transverse component over here. Then it generates love wave and arrive at the second station at the transverse component as well, which shown here. And typically, love wave propagate faster than Rayleigh wave, so it arrived earlier in time shown here than that. So it's all what we expected. So this should show that. Um, this technique is working, although I, I know there's still people don't believe any of this, but I, I guess right now it's fairly well developed. And um, just make this even clearer, if I put a point source over here, so I basically in this case I do cross correlation between this station to all other stations, so basically I put a point source, I want to see what kind of signal I can observe at all other stations, and this is what I can observe. So I, again, I sort it based on distance. So at short distance, the signal arrived earlier. And at long distance, the signal arrived later. And this is exactly what you expect um, for the Rayleigh wave signal. And do notice that we don't really see any body wave signal over here and over like travel faster. So that means that most of the ambient noise, the raw ambient noise, probably only have, well, a lot of it have only surface wave signal in there. And if I just take a, a, a snapshot of one of the record section and see which station is contribute to this uh, big amplitude, then what you can see is that this is the station that with large amplitude. And if I move to the next snapshot to 200 seconds, then you can see the, the um, energy moved out as what you expect. So it's essentially the same as you put a point source here, and everything just does its job. Is it important oh. how you choose the band path? Um, yes. So as I demonstrated in the very beginning, the ambient noise is particularly strong between 5 to 30 seconds. So usually that's the band pass we use. And if I band pass to different period band, because surface wave actually sensitive to different depths, then actually it will propagate in different velocity, which I, I will show a little bit later. But the shape of the filter is not so important? Uh, well, it will affect the waveform you observe, yeah. But um, I, I'm not sure, like, how do you mean different type of waveform, or wave, uh, filter? Just the shape, I mean, if you bound pass with a high slope? Or yeah, usually we use a Gaussian band pass filter. And I imagine if you use different bandpass filter, you will observe different signal. But the, the first order property probably will be probably very similar. Which uses zero phase filter? Zero phase filter? Yeah, Gaussian uses zero phase. Okay. So you don't change the phase relations of the wave. No, no. So here I just think um, movie is always good in presentation. I'll show some movies. So here again, I use this station to cross correlation between this station to other station and try to see how the Rayleigh wave moves out. And at the same time, I can also put a point source to generate love wave and try to see how the energies move out. But of course, for love wave, you really cannot put a point source and generate love wave. So what happens is that you more like tweak this part a little bit. So then you start to so you tweak a little bit and the love wave generate in all directions. So let me just show this movie very quickly. And you can see the 
energy move out very nicely. And if, if I, well, let me stop a little bit later. So you can see a very nice ring. So that means um, it, the assumption that we put a point source, this is like a point source, it's really a good assumption. And, and one couple of things to notice here, the ring is larger for love wave. That means love wave propagate faster than radio wave, ex what we expected. Another thing to notice is that you really don't have a homogeneous ring. So that means um, in some direction, wave noise actually is stronger. So like this part and this part and this part and this part. It's likely due to the oceanic wave, it's particularly stronger going that direction and coming down in this direction. So there's some radiation pattern, but again, this, I think um, we got to the conclusion that this is not enough to stop us from trying to infer for tomography. Yeah. No. So I don't understand exactly what okay. it is. So let me the difference between like, well, I just have a velocity structure and I put a point source and look how it propagates versus... Right. That, that, that can be done if you have a model, you put a point source, you can model how the wave right. move out. So what's this? This is um, data. There's no model. I don't know the structure beneath here. And this is all... So um, effectively, what happens is I create a real source on here, like if think this is an earthquake. If you have an earthquake, then you have all these dense station. You can monitor how the wave energy actually move out. Right, but you don't have to do any correlation to that. You can right. model it. Right. Uh, is that how long the intensity of the cross correlation? Yeah, the, this is the intensity of the cross correlation. Right. But I just, I'm just trying to understand what you use the source for in the correlation. So, you may, Right. I I There's no earthquake. There's no earthquake. <laughs> but but effectively, we create an earthquake where you, you would see the same thing. Well, beside the moment tensor, but uh, yeah, mostly it will be the same thing. Sorry. That's fine. So so if effectively we want to study how this kind of wave propagates out, then try to infer for structure in this region. And um, as I mentioned a couple of times, there's very important property of this. Uh, of surface wave, which called dispersion property. So if I take a, a ambient noise cross correlation record, this is actually the broadband. Then if I then pass to different frequency, this is short period, this is two longer periods. And what happens is that the longer period, the wavelength is longer, it's sensitive to deeper structure, and it propagates faster. So it arrives, so here's zero, here it arrives earlier than the short period signal. So by study, how fast this wave move, can, we can use it to infer for structure at different depth. And so first type of measurement we, we can make out of um, this kind of dispersion is the uh, group dispersion curve. So let me just uh, make sure I under everybody understand what group means. So if you have a, say, take the 5 to 14 second signal, after you bend past that, you have something like this. And then the envelope um, I, I showed in that plot, which I'll explain a little, little later, is, is the envelope function for this waveform. So it's pretty much contour um, the waveform. So it does not have negative. It's always positive. So here, for different period shown here, like for, for 5 to 14, for example, that would be somewhere here. You can think that the, uh, in this direction, I can plot an envelope function. Like here is small and then go up and go small again to fit exactly the same as this. So um, by monitor where the peak arrival of this envelope function, then I can determine the group velocity for um, each seismogram. Is, is that clear? Or, so it, it's the group's measurement. 
Well, and it's worth pointing out that so there's these two speeds of dispersive waves. And one is the speed that the individual peaks and troughs move, and the other is the speed that energy moves at. And so the group uh, velocity is the is the velocity that the whole packet moves. And so that's the packet, that's the speed that energy moves at. Right, right. And the, the um, you can also measure the the peak. Um, that will be the phase velocity, which is shown here. But if you band pass the signal to a particular frequency, actually you have couple peak. So the, the problem sometimes there's cause some ambiguity is which uh, peak should you choose. And the nice thing about the Earth is that we pretty much have a good idea what Earth structure really is. So that means that we know what the curve should look like. So we know which peak to uh, pick. So this is just two type of measurement. One is pick. Um, Basically, try to get the group when, to see when the group arrived. Another is try to get when the peak arrived. And um, they actually, these two information is somehow complementary, but both are uh, useful in terms of cons uh, resolving the Earth structure. So here is just um, some typical um, dispersion curve. So here is uh, two stations. Um, go through the central valley, so it goes through the sedimentary basin. So if you look at the dispersion curve for this path, which is shown as red here, at short period, it's most sensitive to shallow structures, such as um, the sedimentary basin over there, so it propagates very slow. So both really is um, solid line and love is dashed line. So both really and love will propagate very slow, but if you look at a path, go through Sierra Nevada, because the igneous rock propagate much faster. So both really and love propagate much faster than the red line over there. So this is just a first order comparison that show you that dispersion curve for different paths actually reveal some information about structure. But when you go to longer period, it starts to sensitive to deeper structure. Then the difference become much smaller, um, which is probably because there's some high velocity underneath this uh, sedimentary basin. So later on, um, basically, I will use this dispersion measurement as the raw data try to infer for structures. All right. So third year, all right, it start getting more, more and more exciting. I start to look the real data already. Then now I can try to infer for some real structure, which is, for me at that time is very exciting. So let's see. Just before I start to show some of my results, I just want to motivate um, what the past work have been done. So if you look at global surface wave tomography, this is often what the structure you can see. And um, it, this is for radio wave at 35 seconds and radio wave at 50 seconds. And this is their inverted uh, phase velocity structure. And you can see that if you zoom into Western US, you see a red blob over here, and you see a blue um, cratonic fast anomaly over there. So in a sense, it does not provide a lot of regional information. Like you don't see Sierra Nevada and base, uh, Central Valley, for example. So the global uh, inversion tells you a lot of nice big scale structure, but does not provide some important regional information. But if you look some regional study, you start to see a little bit more. So this is done by uh, Susan Vendely and Nolet uh, in 1997. So they use regional earthquake and try to infer for um, regional structure. And now you can start to see Colorado Plateau over here a little bit. This is their model at 100 kilometer depth. But still, it's kind of still have low resolution. So what we want to achieve is get a do a better job, of course, with the US array and the new uh, ambient noise stuff we're trying to develop. So um, if, yeah, yesterday, Dave mentioned that we shouldn't consider Earth as a ping pong ball. But actually, here, I would like everybody to think surface wave is more like perfect on ping pong ball. And uh, it's just, for me, it's easier that way. So that consider this is Earth or a ping pong ball. And it's pretty much, because surface wave only propagate near the surface. So you can consider it's propagate on a very thin layer or on the membrane. And if we hit 
give a force here, then you can imagine that the membrane will actually deform and um, will, will actually propagate. And as I mentioned, for different periods of surface wave, it's sensitive to deeper, different uh, depth structure. So for me, I would think different period of surface wave actually propagate on different membranes. And at the end, I will put all the membranes together so I can uh, get a 3D structure. But right now, I'm only interested in 2D structure. So for different period, I will try to infer for the structure um, along a membrane. And if you do have a membrane, then this is the wave equation you can use, which is called uh, 2D Helmholtz equation. So um, here, the second derivative of time of this, U is just the wave field. This tells you the acceleration of this particle. And the Laplacian of the wave field tells you your position relative to your surrounding. Um, if your, every particle near you is uh, higher than you, that means it wants to, to move up, like give you up acceleration. If this is too difficult, you can think a trampoline. Like if you jump in the center, you are lower than uh, everything around you, then that means your La, uh, the Laplacian term is positive. That means you want, it will eventually push you up. So this is, will be the wave equation we will use to study uh, some Earth structure. So if you don't have force, then just consider a wave propagation. This is, again, the 2D Helmholtz equation. And here I will start to consider single frequency. So um, for single frequency wave, I can actually assume at each location, the wave is just more like so, uh, sine wave. And you have a particular amplitude and particular phase over here. And the phase here is related with the travel time. So when t equal to travel time, that means I have zero phase. And then when the time goes on, it will start oscillate. And if I substitute to this equation to into here, then what I end up with is the solution of Helmholtz equation. And um, just show here. And in most of the time, when omega is large, then we can throw this, time, this term out. So that, that is the high frequency approximation. Then this will reduce to this, which is uh, called a kernel equation. So what the kernel equation tells you is that if you know the travel time, so if I, I have a wave going through this to there, so the travel time there will be um, larger than travel time. So here, if the source is here, the travel time is among zero, then it will go up. So the gradient of this travel time map tells you the direction of wave propagation, which is k here. It also tells you how fast um, the wave move across this region. And traditional way to dealing with this is you take the integral on both sides, then um, the travel time between um, source A and receiver B is just an integration of <coughs> of some time, <coughs> excuse me. So it's a distance, a segment of distance divided by velocity. That gives you a segment of time. You, you integral along the path, then you get the, uh, the travel time. So based on that kind of theory, the ray theory, we can actually try to invert for structure. Now finally get to some map, which is very nice. And um, so in this application, it's ambient noise. So we have measurement between each station pair, every station pair, in, in fact. And this is a second Rayleigh wave. And then, um, so what we essentially want to invert is the velocity structure in, within the Western US. And this is the result. So as I mentioned, that a, a second Rayleigh wave is most sensitive to shallow structure is in the crust. So now you can start to see the contrast between Sierra Nevada and the Central Valley very nicely. This kind of crustal structure was not, um, is harder to resolve from earthquake measurement and can only be resolved based on ambient noise result. So at the same time, you have some other structure like um, Columbia Basin and some other feature, uh, which I will try to say a little bit more later on. But there's do have one complexity is the ray path. So I, I did mention that in able to integrate the travel time, you really need to know the ray path. And if you have structure like this, actually the ray path can bend. Say so if you 
see the animation. If you use this model and just put an impulse force here, then you can see the waveform actually bend, so the ray actually bend. So that means you don't really know the ray path is, so you cannot really confidentially do an integral to estimate the travel time. In fact, if you, um, based on this kind of simulation, you see a lot of path when it goes through this um, heterogeneity region, everything is banded. And so that means the straight ray assumption is probably not a good assumption. So here I, I just want to show, a, for me, it's a more intuitive method. And well, probably because that's the method I use. But, um, but I always try to convince you it's really the more intu intuitive method. So as uh, Greg just mentioned, uh, actually you can compare. It looks very similar for when you have animation. On the left, it's based on ambient noise cross creation. And on the right, is a simulation based on um, just numerical model. You can see actually the wave propagate in this almost the same way. So this one is only based on numerical, so there's no data in there. Of course, we do invert for some structure. But this one is based on ambient noise cross creation. And you can see there's a lot of similarity in terms of how wave propagate in these two kind of uh, movie, like this band here, because it goes through slow anomaly, so everything is kind of trapped here. So let, let me just let it run. And so in a way, we don't really need to run numerical simulation to determine the ray, because from this, how we, we actually really know from our data how the wave actually propagates. So this lead to the, um, the kernel tomography, so, oops. Um, okay, so, so what, what we do for a kernel tomography is that for here, if I have a point source, then I measure the travel time between this station to all other stations. So it's color coded, so everything here, the travel time is small, then we go farther and farther away, the travel time becomes larger and larger. Then we can fit a travel time surface on this. So because the station is so dense pop, uh, distributed, we can fit, we can determine each location what the travel time is. Then just by using the kernel equation directly, the gradient of this travel time tells us the velocity structure at each location. And I don't even need to run inversion. This automatically, after you know how the wave propagates, you know the velocity. Is that easier? Well, I, I do feel so. Oh, hopefully. <laughs> uh, uh, well, uh, um, so here is another example. If I have a point source and I, I map out the velocity and I take the gradient, so this tells me direct um, look, information on velocity structure at each location, which show here. And uh, also the gradient of the travel time map over here tells us the direction of wave propagation. And you can see it's not very good, but it's a good start, if I, I would say, because this is just based on one single source. And effectively, each station, as I described it, can be considered as a point source. So we can repeatedly measure the velocity at each location from different direction. And this is the result. So at, for example, 12 seconds at two locations, if I plot the velocity measurement based on wave coming from different direction, then that's the red arrow bar shown here. And you can s start to see there's some um, as mutual dependent, like wave coming from different direction have different velocity, which is uh, evidence of anisotropy. So in effect, we actually end up fitting um, the velocity as a function of as mutual. And we also have, so the, basically the mean of this is the isotropic we will get. And the anisotropy will tell us the fast direction for this wiggle part, as well as the amplitude of that anisotropy. So this kind of tube and anisotropy was observed with body wave, but never observed really with surface wave until we have this US array. And just a quick comparison between a traditional inversion based on ray theory and a kernel. And you can see that the comparison looks fairly good. And for me, I would say a kernel takes me very last, very small amount of computational time. And it can achieve the same result. So for me, I think it's a good, very good deal. And this is 24 second really wave phase velocity. Now you start to see some deeper structure. Like this is the bathyless of the Sierra Nevada. 
you can start to see the slow anomaly beneath the Snake River Plain, High Lava Plain. So there's a lot of features start to show up at this step, at this period. So um, just show like more update map. And there's 10 second rally wave, 30 second rally wave. 10 second is about, I would think around 10 kilometer depth. And 30 is probably around 40 to 50 kilometer depth. So this is pretty much crustal feature. And this is more like uh, upper mental feature, which we can resolve. And now, um, I don't know, I, I know there's a, probably a lot of audience can say each feature better than I do, but uh, just point some major one, like Central Valley, Sierra Nevada, and the Green River Basin, Colorado Plateau over here. And so all, all these features can be very nicely imaged. And, in, in the uh, shallow part for 10 seconds. And you can also do this for a, up to 30 seconds based on ambient noise and you start to see some deeper structure. So this is probably most, mostly correspond to into upper most mental structure. So you see some uh, the thick um, crust for the um, Southern Rocky and you see the uh, Snake River Plain fast anomaly relative to the surrounding of the Colorado Plateau and some other features. So overall, this map is um, kind of very nice. It if you remind yourself what um, 10 years ago, what people observed and compared to this, I would say this is definitely better. And then I can also get azimuthal and isotropy from our measurement. So each arrow bar here, so this is 12. 26 and 38 second really wave result. And um, at 12 second, um, each bar means the NSH we observe at that particular region. So that uh, the direction of the bar is the fast direction of really wave. And the, the length of the bar represents the amplitude of NSH. So you can see that at short period, this is most sensitive to crust. This is most sensitive to upper mental to 38 seconds. You can see that the anisotropy pattern actually is different between these two. That means um, essentially we want to invert for crustal anisotropy and uppermost mental anisotropy. So let's go to the fourth year. Um, well, not much going on because my son was born and I was busy with diaper and feeding. <laughs> and, but well, I guess it's now a good time like, to think what happened in the first three years. If there's any question, I would love to answer. Uh, yeah, but maybe not with this feature on. Yeah, or otherwise, I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. For the anisotropy maps yeah. that you showed, are there um, regions that are more confident than others? Or you know, is there some kind of uncertainty yeah, so, so we have uncertainty estimate at each point, actually, in fact. So they, they do have um, different, um, different regions have different confidence. Particular on the edge, usually we, we have very poor uh, data coverage, so we don't constrain the edge very well. But um, bes I would say beside the edge and um, other place, it's pretty robust, actually, because the, you, if you remember our road measurement, when you have those wiggle fit very well, then we, we, we have high confidence in our NSHB measurement. So I think at this period, Ben, um, we are very confident with, with our NSHB results. So one thing that's interesting is that places where you have strong correlation between your crustal NSHB and your mantle NSHB versus places that you have very weak correlation. Have you kind of looked at that to try to think about the significance of it? Uh, so like, like where? Uh, looking at the around Yellowstone, you see a really different thing. Oh, you mean here? Yeah. Well, I, I would say that's the edge of our map. Uh, yeah, for that re for this study here. And just just in general, uh, trying to interpret what the crustal signal means. Well, it's to what the mantle structure. Actually, we do compare the, whether the, see whether there's correlation between crust and upper mantle, and in general, we see very weak. We almost see no correlation at all. So, um, well, I don't want to go too far saying what that means because I, I will angry a lot of people. 
Uh, <laughs> Don't you think some places where it's really strong, though? Like, look at the Nevada. Yeah, the water. This is very strong. Yeah, and then in, in, in Nevada, near Reno. Uh, th here? Yeah, yeah, this is, um, yeah, this is strong as well. Strong correlation. Yeah, and actually, we, later on, I will show you is, um, there's two types of NSHB, and both show very strong NSHB in basin and range area. But in general, if you can see that here is very coherent, here actually it turns. So that's why we say this very weak correlation between fast direction in the crust and upper mantle. But that's just observation. I don't know. I don't know. What, yeah. To what degree, the, the kernels are kind of spread out, so to what degree is 38 seconds? Well, 38 12 seconds is... The lift, 12 seconds is shallower, but 38 seconds might include... Right, right, minutes. right. So 12 seconds, I think it's most sensitive to like from 0 to maybe 15, or, or even a little bit deeper. Yeah, but 38 is it's very broad, but I would think it's from 20 to 50, something like that. So. So it's not average. So it's an average, right. But, but it, it's not averaging with most shallow stuff. No, probably not. Right. But eventually, we will try to use uh, 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 all this information at different periods and try to invert for 3D structure, which we'll show in the last part of the talk. OK. I, OK, let's jump through this. And then, of course, not just ambient noise, you want to do earthquake application. And there's some two difficulty with earthquake application. One is that all the path actually is very far away from your receiver. So if you really want to get it right, you need to uh, in invert for structure within this area as well. But as I show that, that is very difficult. You don't really know, you don't have good idea on the detailed structure outside of your array. And another uh, difficulty is um, an earthquake application, usually you're, it's longer period. So say if you have a signal, um, an earthquake here, a receiver here, if you have main arrival, which shows the first peak, and if you have the second arrival, uh, due to some sort of scattering shown here, then if you want to do a, a, a long, period way, long period measurement, so you bend past this to a long period, and what happens is that you don't see a distinct arrival. So effectively, if you measure a travel time based on this, you are affecting both by this and that signal. And that means you are not just sensitive to structure along the ray, you are also sensitive to structure off the ray. And so usually people, uh, one approach is consider a finite frequency kernel. So instead of um, sensitivity is only on the ray, you also consider sensitivity outside of that ray. But for me, again, I don't think this is, it, I think it's too complicated, so I have a, my own approach, which I will try to argue against it's easier, and we'll see. So if you go back to um, my Helmholtz um, and a, a kernel equation slide, so if you look, here is the solution. And this is without assumption of high frequency. So effectively, this actually account the finite frequency effect. So this will be, that means if I can measure the amplitude, I can account the finite frequency effect without doing too much complicated work. So that's the thing, the equation I'm going to use. And again, I use the same example for the Curio Island event. For the wave coming through, I can measure the travel time. So wave arrive earlier here, arrive late here, and I can map out the travel time. And at the same time, I can also determine the amplitude of the wave, which is shown here. So you have this is very small amplitude, and the wave usually have larger amplitude on the blue region. So at the first look, you look this, yeah, it's too complicated, maybe we shouldn't use amplitude. But in fact, the reason cause this is uh, due to just interference of two waves. So if I show, like if you have two wave, uh, two source, for example, and you can see that the, if you are on this, this line, everything major, the wave will have larger amplitude than here, almost have no amplitude. So this striping feature is the exactly the same as that striping feature over there. That means what happens is that for far away earthquake, usually this wave interfere with each other. So it's, um, you really need to use this kind of information to get the velocity structure right. And 
if you, I go back to the equation I use over here, and this part is the a kernel equation. So this, if I just take the gradient of this map, this is the velocity I can estimate. And you can see a stripe feature, which is bias is not really correspond to into any uh, structure there. But if you calculate this term, the second term, based on amplitude term, you see an anti-correlation between this and that. Right? That's, that should be very clear. Then if you add these two, get, two together and to estimate the velocity structure, you get this. So now the structure looks much better. You don't have the stripe apparent uh, bias, and you start to see some real structures, such as Snake River Plain, the Yellowstone, and the uh, Southern Rocky Mountain. So this is very nice without doing too much trouble with inversion, without do too much trouble to construct finite fre frequency kernel. <laughs> And this allows us to um, get a structure much easier. So if I can go to the next slide. Why Rocky Mountain is so? Why Rocky Mountain is so? Yeah, this period is 60 seconds because the Rocky Mountain is um, much thicker. So effectively, it has um, thicker crust. So crust usually is slower than mental. So because it sensitive, the sensitivity range is quite broad, so it's also sensitive to cross feature, and that's why it's low. Yeah. So then I will try to average all the events, and just try to show a very quick comparison between the two methods. If you just use the uh, gradient of the travel time, then this, each, um, this tells you the di uh, distribution of your velocity measurement at this location, and basically from different earthquakes. Then you see this very broad. And if you use Helmholtz, then everything becomes narrow in. That means you have uh, smaller uncertainty in your estimation of the velocity structure. And this is the final result, basically, based on two different tomography methods. This is if we don't correct for that second turn. This is what happens if we correct for the second turn. And at 40, 60, and 80 seconds. So this is uppermost mental and a little bit deeper than the uppermost mantle and a little bit more deeper. So then um, mainly you see this very similar structure uh, if you use Helmholtz tomography. But if you use uh, a kernel, which is a ray theory approximation, you see uh, a lot of features start to more like blur out. So you don't see very high resolution result like, um, like Snake, River, Snake River Plan, for example. Like the anomaly disappear when you go to longer period. But it's stay almost the same um, if you account for the finite frequency effect. So it, it's just a nice thing to account. Like if you have the amplitude information, then by accounting it, you start to see better result. And several things to mention that um, here you can see the Isabella anomaly uh, much very clearly, and also the subduction slab start to show up here, which is very nice. So we we'll also just try to make sure our story is consistent. We can compare ambient noise and earthquake result at uh, some inter intersecting period, like 24 seconds. You can see that the result we got from ambient noise and from earthquake are almost identical, uh, which gives us good confidence on our result. And also in isotropy, we do ambient noise, we do earthquake at a 26 second period. And if you look far away, it, there's a lot of similarity between the feature, like here the fast anomaly in this direction and this, and rotate to north-south and north-south. But they do have some difference, particularly near the edge over here, the edge over here. So in a way, this give the comparison uh, show they are consistent, give us much higher confidence in our results. And well, I, I think it's nice, like just to see that wave coming from different sources actually give you the same result, which means that what you see is probably really the structure effect. And so now we have a broad range of period, sensitive from shallow part, 10 seconds, 30 seconds is lower cross uppermost mantle to upper mantle itself. So you can start to see the transition of structure from shallow to uh, deep. And this information will allow us to infer for 3D structures. 
And any question for the year five? Yes. Um, so, actually, radiation pattern can also create this kind of interference pattern, but it does not affect the final result because what we only care is how we propagate through our array. So, if your radiation pattern causes some interference or causes some, something weird, but as far as the consider the wave equation, this should still satisfy the wave, equa wave equation. So even your, even your source is very complicated. You have two sources, for example. But as far as we know how they interfere, then we don't really care what the source property really is. I'm not sure whether, does that answer your question? That's fine. What about attenuation? Attenuation, we assume, is negligible. But um, at this scale, it does look like, we, we are looking into it, but it does look the effect is very small because um, usually attenuation become kicking after like 10 wavelengths or something or, or even longer path and this is region is just so small in terms of compared to wavelengths so the effect is very small all right so I'm not sure whether I really convince you that this is easier approach but in, in terms of computational this is very fast because all you do is you track the, the you, you get the travel time, you get the amplitude. This is all raw data. Then you just calculate a spatial gradient, and you got a result. There's not, no regularization, no inversion, nothing. And boom, the results show up, and it looks nice. So um, I, I think it's good. So. <laughs> so let me just go into the final part, which um, of course, nobody interested in 2D result. Everybody interested in 3D structure. So what we essentially try to get is inverse 3D structure. So as I mentioned, different period actually sensitive to different depth, but the sensitivity is actually quite broad. So in able to in, um, to determine the velocity at certain depth, we need to do a inversion. So for example, a point over here, if I plot a, a dispersion curve for Rayleigh wave. It's shown here. So a short period merely determined by the ambient noise tomography map. And a long period merely determined by earthquake tomography map. And so what we want to do is try to find a 1D structure beneath this point. Try to fit this dispersion curve. And usually, this, the problem is this unique is not unique. So there's a lot of structure which can fit this dispersion curve. So usually, you need to. Uh, apply some regularization, you apply some uh, presumption on the structure. Sometimes you put the structure you want to see in there, and of course you got what you want to see at the end. But what, what we want to do here is try to be a little bit broad. We try to find all the structure that can fit our um, dispersion curve. So we run a Monte Carlo simulation. So all the curve here show the, the gray line, which is effectively the curve that can be accepted. That means it's it can fit out data reasonably well. And we say all this is probably the model. And then, of course, we want to show a single model. So we take the mean to show that. And just take uh, uh, the model at two different depths, 15, 15 kilometer depth and 50 kilometer depth. So this is just cross. This is um, uppermost mental. And again, you see some several features that um, you can tell like the basilisk of the Sierra Nevada, Colorado Plateau, and the basilisk of Snake River Plain. And also in the mantle, you start to see the Isabella anomaly and see the Snake River Plain very well. And again, this kind of resolution can only be achieved after we have US array as well as ambient noise tomography. And we can also plot some cross-section across our model. So here's just two cr uh, cross-section. So this one actually shows a very nice slab of the Farallone slab shown here. And you can see very slow anomaly near the mental weight area. And you can also see the subduction slab in this cross-section over here. And the, the mental weight is somehow connected 
to the uh, slow anomaly of Finnish Snake River Plain and uh, Yellowstone hotspot. So, um, in, in overall, like couple, I, I forgot it's yesterday or the day before, people saying that in global tomography, you really don't see a slab going all the way, like particularly in the shallow part, you don't really see slab penetrate uh, through the earth, but um, I think that's because body wave really don't have sensitivity for the shallow earth. And surface wave does provide complementary information regarding to that aspect. And so you can see very clearly that um, the slab going down. And well, I, I guess right now a lot of people is working on joint inversion between body wave and surface wave. So you can start to create a more like coherent model to see all the structure together. So um, as I said, we, we also want to study a little bit on anisotropy. And um, we have Rayleigh wave measurement, we have love wave measurement. So there's one type of anisotropy called radio anisotropy because love wave is sensitive to wave propagate in horizontal direction but polarized in horizontal direction. But Rayleigh wave, on the other hand, is sensitive to wave polarized in vertical direction. So presumably they can have different velocity. So first thing we try to do is if you find a point if you plot the dispersion curve for Rayleigh wave, this is Rayleigh wave phase, Rayleigh wave group, and love wave phase. And you try to see whether you have a 1, 1D isotropic structure which can fit all the dispersion curve spontaneously. And what you find is that in some region, like the white area over here, the misfit is small. Um, that means isotropic structure can explain your result. But there's a lot of huge region, like black part over here, that means that you cannot explain the uh, you cannot explain your data very well with the isotropic structure. So then we do the next step, trying to see what kind of anisotropy we require to get this. So what happened is that we, we, we find out we need uh, some crustal anisotropy as well as some mental anisotropy so that we can fit our observation for, for particular in the basin and range area. And so that back to Craig's question, why we see a huge anisotropy here, but it's not just azimuthal anisotropy, it's also radial anisotropy. Like here, we require a cross to have huge amount of anisotropy. And as many of you probably know that uh, basin range is a place um, have been deformed a lot over the past years. And um, the assumption is that if you have crustal minerals such as mica in this region, then when you deform the crust and um, somehow the deformation will align mineral like mica and then because mica is highly anisotropic, then you will start to see this kind of anisotropy feature. So, yeah. Is this a particular, this, this is that white gap. So that's the middle, uh, this, this range, it's the middle uh, crust anisotropy. So it's crustal, it's middle and lower crust. So from our data, so this is only possible after you have ambient noise, you start to see some detailed structure in the crust and particular, and accessory is particularly interesting because it allows you to uh, understand a little bit on the deformation of the rock. And we have also as mutual and accessory which we can invert it for. So for each location, we can try to plot the fast direction as well as the amplitude of an isotropy, which show here. Like for different periods from 10 to 50, like you have different fast direction and different an isotropy amplitude. And what we try to find is that what kind of an isotropy in, in each location is required to fit this kind of an isotropic dispersion curve. And what we end up realizing is that, again, we need an SHP both in the cross and upper mantle. And so for this example shown here for the dispersion curve, we require an SHP in the middle and lower cross um, with fast direction point like uh, almost north-south. And in the upper mantle, on the other hand, we, we need a fa fast direction, more like east-west fast direction, so that we can fit the dispersion curve. And if we plot the final result, um, this is uh, the anisotropy model on top of our isotropic model. And um, you can see that the crustal anisotropy and upper mental anisotropy is very different. So again, that leads to 
uh, our argument that it seems to be not correlated. But um, again, um, I know people have different feeling on, on what's the reason for this. So I, I'm not going to go into that. But um, there's several features that are quite interesting. For example, you can see that the fast anomaly is um, parallel to the, um, the shear of the um, St. Andrew fault, parallel to that fault. So probably the anisotropy is aligned due to the shearing of the St. Andrew fault. And this part is mainly uh, parallel to the subduction. So it's probably affecting by the subduction system. And you have this broad range of slow anomaly, which kind of coexists with the east-west fast direction. And if you look some of the SKS uh, anisotropy result, this is also the um, largest anisotropy they, they observe. So it's, it's somehow consistent. So this, I, I forgot, I think it's one of our professor in Colorado actually mentioned that if you block this part, actually this, this anomaly looks like a perfect like fan. I don't know whether you can see it. And the anisotropy is kind of always radiate from that Snake River plan. So, but I don't know what that means, but it's somehow interesting too. So there's a lot of interesting feature, and I don't think we understand this kind of information well enough. So that means, I, I, don't, I guess, dynamics people and uh, geology people can help us out here. So um, just around a short conclusion. So there's three types of events uh, happening in the last couple of years. So first one is this advance in terms of getting new source. So ambient noise in particular, uh, combined with earthquake, can be used to study crust to upper mantle structure. And we also show some methodology advance in terms of tomography. And um, hopefully, we show this is an easier way. And in, in the end, you also get a very high quality, high resolution result of the uh, crust and upper mantle structure, including anisotropy. And, the, and the finally, probably is the most important actually, is the advance in data. Now we have this nice US array. I, I don't think any of this study can be done with this data set. So I, I think um, it's probably the most important factor for us. So I will put it up here. Thank you. You mean yeah. this part? Yeah, I'm just saying, I mean, you have a strong structural gradient. You have a lot of, uh, not just the topography, but the faults penetrating into the. Well, the, uh, this step is middle and lower cross. So I'm not sure whether those. Right, so I'm not sure those penetrate to that depth. But some, it, it's quite interesting, actually, that somehow this region is um, the same as where we see the strongest radio anisotropy. So this might, might be a common course for two types of anisotropy, but. Um, we, I, I guess I, I don't know like mineralogy good, uh, good enough or uh, any dynamics good enough to explain why this, this is the case. How yeah. important is it to know where the moho is to know the structure near the moho? Right. So um, if I go back to this one, actually, actually you can see that. Um, this is the moho, and actually we use receiver function as a constraint. So we don't, the sort of surface where since the sensitivity is very broad, you, you don't really have good constraint in terms of depth. You have some constraint, but it's not like super sensitive to sharp structure. So we use receiver function as a, a, a constraint, and we just perturb around it, basically. Yeah. Can you say a little bit more about your Monte Carlo inversion? Well, one station is perfectly clear, but when you have, say, 300 stations, how do you sort of take care of the lateral? Well, we, we actually, um, it, it's not station, it's uh, located on the grid point. So from our map, and we, we pretty much just run them independently. We don't um, have any constraint, like whether this point and the next point need to be correlated at all. But in fact, our map itself already been smooth. So when we invert for this, actually, um, it's somehow smooth as well in terms of lateral. And 
Um, but that's a good question, like particularly if you have like sharp structure boundary, like for example, jumping from basin and range to Colorado Plateau, then um, our map is somehow smooth. And so whether there's a way that we can try to determine this sharp edge, it is still unknown. It it pretty much, yeah. Yes. So if, if you were going to look ten years in the future, I, I already studied this for five years. Okay. Ten years. <laughs> <laughs> So are, are, are you, with the perception of these data sets, there won't be a US array every five years probably, right? No, why not? I'm just guessing. Oh, yeah. okay. Okay. So, so in, in that case, can you start to use these same type of techniques with a sparser network? Yeah, you got lower and, resolution. And, and, and so, if, if what, hap what would happen in your models if you started like randomly taking out stations? Well, you got point does it become a, a hopeless task? Well, the method is still valid, but uh, the resolution becomes poorer and poorer, as you can imagine when you take off. And eventually, you don't see any high quality result. So that's why I put the data as the most important part. Right. So, yeah. I think perhaps this, this is my speculation. If you start to taking out stations, then the method that you propose, which actually I, I do like, is going to break down. How so like you can take the gradients. Well, you, you can. Um, I, I think what happened is that, for, for example, if you really want to resolve this, at least you need to have some station in between. If you take one station out, then the structure here, for me, it's all meshed in together, and then you are not going to resolve it. That's correct. And so actually, this method is only developed because we have US array, and this, but it's a, just a new way, and uh, in my perspective, an uh, easier way to get the same result. Yeah. And, but I, I do feel like, like Pascal experiment, for example, if you put like almost um, very wide dispute um, station that say if it's 100 kilometers apart from each station, then you probably can get to 100 kilometer resolution, which is pretty nice too. Yeah. So I think so far the only place we test this is in the US and in China, because China we start, if you really know people there, they do have a lot of data, very dense coverage, and this method seems to work there as well. How about the direction of propagation of noise? Uh, yeah, well, unfortunately, I, I, ha I have only six years to study this, so I haven't really got into that, but um, that's a big issue, like whether the source actually affects your measurement. Of course it does, but how severe it affects. Um, I think there's a lot of other people is working on that, and I, I don't think I'm in a good position to answer that. <laughs> 